everyone, my name is Avram, one of the fifth years, um, recently graduated from BOTS and today I have a very special guest lecturer with me. Um, she is from the International Medical School University um, in Malaysia. Um, hi everyone, my name is Felicity Ng. I will be, um, it's, really, it's really great to be here with Avram giving this lecture to everyone here today. So I hope you enjoy it um, and yeah, just uh, sit back and relax. <laughs> mm -hmm. And just want to apologize as, uh, as well um, for those who were expecting a live stream yesterday there was a bit of technical difficulty so we have to go with recording it yep. okay so this lecture will be about managing water emergency as, as an fmi one so we'll be covering four cases together um, two medical and two surgical and these cases i would say they're quite common um, they're quite common emergencies which can happen on the ward and as an fmi one i think it's important that we know how to handle these cases on our own okay so just a quick disclaimer um, that everything here is purely coincidental, just keep that in mind, okay? So how this is going to work is it will be a case-based discussion, we'll go through four cases and basically we'll be telling a story, okay? So this is, this is about a 73-year-old gentleman, he has been having fast food for seven days a week and he presents to A&E with yellowish discoloration, tea colored urine and pale stools. He has had a history of intermittent right upper quadrant pain over the last few years, but has never seeked medical attention about it. An ultrasound scan was performed and they found the stone in his common bowel duct, and the stone was then removed using ERCP. Okay? So this is our gentleman. He is our patient for the day and we have to take care of him. So he is now on, the, on your ward. You are an FY1 on call. He is on your ward, you're taking care of him. 36 hours after his ERCP, he presents with severe epigastric pain which radiates to the back. Um, he describes it as sharp and crushing and the score is 9 out of 10. He has vomited twice and is looking dehydrated. The nurse bleeds you with his vitals and as you can see, he's tachycardic, he's running on temperature and staph kidney as well. His blood pressure is fine. So keep, take note of these presenting features and just have a quick um, couple of seconds or so to think about what his differential. Um, I'm just going to be zooming past this just so that I don't prolong this lecture anymore but we're going to go with a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis for this lecture. Okay, So you being a competent FY1 doctor, you did ABCDE and you did his bloods and these are the results. Um, we've highlighted the abnormal results in orange whereby it's elevated and in blue if it's depressed. Okay. So as you can see on, a, on ABCD as well, the abnormality you get is that he is tender in the epigastric region and he has signs of dehydration. So what is his risk stratification score? Um, and by that I mean the Glasgow uh, modified Glasgow criteria. And I'm sure you all are familiar with, with this already, but basically it's using the mnemonic pancreas. I think it's really important for us to be able to memorize this mnemonic, especially in exams. So based on this values, um, if you can tell me what his score is on this slide, just give yourself a couple of moments and what his score is. Pause, pause here if you don't want to know the score, if you need a bit more time, but he has a score of four. So in this case, um, since he has a score of four, you would consider admission to ICU because um, it is classified as severe pancreatitis, as it is. Okay, CT scan of the abdomen. So this is what his CT scan is, has done. So there are a few points about CT scan I think um, at least I was very confused about. So I did a bit of reading on it. And there's a few points about CT scan for acute pancreatitis. First being that it's only indicated after 48 hours from the onset of symptoms. And this is because any changes detectable by imaging for acute pancreatitis can only be seen about um, can only be seen after three days or so. So even after 48 hours, you might not be able to see any changes. Um, and because of this time delay from when you can do a CT scan, CT scan is not actually that useful for the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, but to actually look for any signs of local complications to determine if there's any other cause, um, to exclude any other causes and to exclude other differentials as well. Okay, so just take note, CT is not done immediately, it's done 48 hours after, um, and it's more to look for any complications. Um, in this CT, you can see that here, if you can see my mouse here, 
the pan this is the pancreas and the margins aren't that clear. So the term that they use to describe it is this diffuse parenchymal edema. Sorry, diffuse parenchymal enlargement with edema and there's indistinct margins. So you can't see you can't see the pancreas too well. Okay, moving on. So just a basic definition of pancreatitis, note that there is no mention of infection anywhere. Um, I'm sure you've heard of this to death as well. Um, just two things to note, most commonly it's always either gallstones or ethanol or alcohol and that hypercalcemia is a risk factor for acute pancreatitis but hypocalcemia is a, is a marker of poor prognosis. Okay, so for the official the official definition for the diagnosis, diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, you need to have these three criteria. Clinical laboratory and imaging, two out of these three have to be present. Um, most of the time, it's a combination of clinical and laboratory because these are results which you can get quickly and which you can see the results of. Um, amylase and lipase, just note the levels have to be three times the upper limit of normal. So, and in most cases, the level of amylase will be in the it will be at least a thousand. So it can be elevated, but if it's not three times or at least a thousand, then it's unlikely it's acute pancreatitis. Um, so this is something new that I've learned about recently, something called the Atlanta criteria. It's another way of classifying um, the severity of acute, pan the acute pancreatitis into mild, moderate, and severe. And this is based on the presence of any um, complications or organ failure. So mild, there are no complications, no organ failure. Moderate, you have organ failure which resolves, which resolves in 48 hours and severe, that's when you're a lot more worried because the organ failure lasts for greater than two days. Um, local complications, um, these are some of the ones which can happen. I wouldn't be too worried about it, so don't you don't have to go into great detail to what each one is. Um, just know that these can happen. And in systemic complications, basically, it is anything that can go wrong at all with your body. So sepsis, chronic lung disease, ARDS, anything at all counts as systemic complications. So in terms of Atlanta or Glasgow, uh, which one is used? I would say that um, Glasgow is more commonly used and it's the one which uh, I'm more familiar, familiar with as well. It is easier to quantify because the scores can be calculated of numerical values which are obtained from blood tests which is something you would do in every case of acute pancreatitis. It's done in pretty much every patient presenting to any. So you have these values and it makes it a bit more, um, makes it a bit easier to quantify. Whereas Atlanta is a bit more qualitative where you need to look for the presence of um, complications or organ failure. And this is often um, done with a CT scan. And as you already know, CT scan is not done in the most, it's not done immediately and it's not done in all cases of acute pancreatitis. So these are signs which you just need to know. They're signs of retroperitoneal hemorrhage, um, but they rarely happen in real life. But just know the difference between cullen and gray tetanus, which one is where. Um, just some points on management as well. Your, the mainstay of treatment is supportive. Um, the pancreas will, will recover on its own. Um, and the main thing, it's like, like it's supposed to giving fluids, giving painkillers, uh, making sure their vitals are within normal range. So in terms of keeping patients kneel by mouth, when they first present, yes, you would keep them kneel by mouth until the pain, in, pain nausea, and vomiting subsides. Um, and you normally can reintroduce feeds, I would say, within about 24 hours or so from the presenting, but do it as tolerated. So if they can't tolerate the feed them by mouth, if they can't, then just hold it off for a bit more. Um, in terms of if they do need nutritional support or not, enteral feeding is always preferred over parenteral. Um, just forgot to mention as well, the main reason why you keep a patient nil by mouth at the start is just to reduce any pancreatic stimulation you can get from um, ingesting food. Um, next for CD scan, I think we've covered this already. It's not always necessary. Um, your clinical and laboratory findings are usually enough, um, but later on if the person is not recovering, if they're not feeling better after a few days, that's when you would do it to look for a presence of any complications. Um, and like I said, it takes a few days as well for signs of signs to show up on a CT scan. And the last point on antibiotics, um, I, well, from my experience, there has been quite a lot of debate on it. When do you give antibiotics? When do you not? Um, so from the research and what we've been reading is that you do not give antibiotics unless there are signs of infection. And this is because the purpose of the antibiotics is to treat any infection that might be present and to prevent um, acute pancreatitis from progressing into, from 
from progressing any further and to prevent local complications. The antibiotic itself does not do anything to treat the pancreatitis. Okay, so unless there are signs of infection, for example, raised white cell count, raised CRP temperature, positive blood culture, um, you do not give antibiotics. But as soon as you get any of these markers elevated, it is advisable that you start antibiotics um, straight away to prevent the progression into complications. Um, and some of examples of antibiotics you can use are the penems, so imipenem, carbapenem, and clindamycin as well. But as they always say in hospitals, go according to local guidelines. Okay, so this part is just to make it a little bit more interest, uh, interactive and for you to have something to do. So pretend you're on FY1, you're on a ward, you've seen this, you've done ABCDE, and now you have to write out your plan for your senior to come have a look at it. Okay, so pretend you, you're at the patient's bedside, you've done the test and everything, and just number it from one to however many um, what you would do. So pause this video right here if you need a bit more time, but I'm going to show you next what we would do in this situation. And we're just, again, may not be perfect, but we're trying to be as systematic as possible. We might have missed one or two things out, but this is what we would do, and this covers the mainstay of the treatment as well. So number one, number 12, I think you can read it for yourself, what you would do. Like I say, mainstay is supportive, so fluid, oxygen, morphine, um, that's mainly it, and then KIV antibiotics and the CT. All right, so that's acute pancreatitis done. So this is his latest CT, and in this case, it's, a, it's two things which you look out for. So the white arrows indicate heterogeneous acute necrotic collections in the pancreatic and peripancreatic area. And the white arrow, arrow hits um, represent gas bubbles. So the two of these signs together usually indicate um, signs of an infected necrosis. So this is a severe case of um, acute pancreatitis. I wouldn't be too worried if you can't read a CT of a pancreas. I still can't as well. These are just in case you're interested and want to know more about CTs in acute pancreatitis. So moving on to the next part. Okay, so the story continues. Um, he required an emergency admission to theater for necrosectomy because of the infected uh, necrotic pancreas. Operation was a success, but unfortunately 14 hours post-surgery, he developed shortness of breath as well as mild chest discomfort. Um, and you know from, from history that he has been a chronic smoker of 50 pack years. So the nurse has believed you with his vital signs. Um, as you can see, heart rate is um, borderline um, tachycardic. Uh, his blood pressure is alright. He's not running a temperature. Respiratory rate is on the high side. He's tachypneic. SpO2 is 93% under room air. Um, so, this is what he looks like at the moment. <laughs> okay, so these are the results of his examination. Um, his airway is patent, his breathing only um, significant for reduced chest expansion and air entry on the left side. He also has increased resonance on percussion on the left side. Uh, airway is central and uh, as I've mentioned, SpO2 is 93%. Okay, um, Cardiovascular examination is normal. There's no per peripheral edema as well, in case you were thinking of a um, heart problem. Okay, so um, if you look at this um, chest x-ray, you know, we, we, we did a chest x-ray. Um, what do you think is the diagnosis here? So if you could just take some time to look at it, uh, you can pause the video here if you want. Um, but pay attention to this arrow over here. You can see the lung, um, the outline of the lung. Um, the arrow is pointing to the outline of the lung. And uh, if you notice anything else, um, the patient is very... Um, this, this patient actually has um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as manifested by hyperinflated lungs. If you were to count the, the ribs, the, heart, the anterior ribs, you'll be able to find more than eight visible ribs. Yeah? And also the heart is very tubular in shape, so uh, pathognomic for COPD. So the diagnosis here would be a left side spontaneous pneumothorax. Okay, so what would you do now? So just have a read and um, Yep, so would you call your senior, prepare for needle aspiration or chest strain insertion? Or, yep, so the answer is B. Uh, call your senior and prepare for chest strain insertion. We'll tell you why, yeah? So, but before we go into that, let's look at the principles. Um, first one would be to look for evidence of symptoms. So, 
Um, in this case, patient uh, Ms. Drum had Drum's breath, he also had some chest discomfort. The next thing you want to do is obtain a chest radiograph, like what we have done. And number three is to measure interpleural distance. Okay. So if you were to look at this beautiful um, algorithm here that I got from the um, British Thoracic Society, um, you can quite follow it here, you see. This is our patient here. I hope you can see my mouse. Right. Um, this is our patient here. So he's more than 50, he's got significant smoking history and there's evidence of underlying lung disease on um, examination here. Yeah? So we go down this arrow, he's got secondary pneumothorax as we've already established. And what we want to do next is measure the interpleural distance. So the interpleural distance is essentially the distance between this part of the lung all the way across the chest up to here. So in this case, it would be more than 2 centimeters. So 2 centimeters is your uh, cutoff point. So if it's more than 2 centimeters or he is breathless, you want to follow the algorithm down this way and you want to insert a chest strain size 8 to 14 French. So they can, in, in exams, they can show you however or whatever kind of scenario. So all you need to do is try to really understand the algorithm um, here and um, try to incorporate and apply in your clinical practice. Okay? So um, just some, some basics. Um, when you insert a chest strain, a uh, chest strain is inserted at the uh, safety triangle, which is uh, bound by the borders of the base of axilla, the lateral edge of the latissimus dorsi, the fifth intercostal space, as well as the lateral edge of the pectoralis uh, major. Okay. So um, we're going to do the same thing as what we did with the first case, the acute pancreatitis. I'm going to outline your plan, make it a bit more interesting. So um, if you could just list down um, things that you would do as an FY1 in order of priority, that would be great. So um, of course you can pause this video uh, here and check it later. Yeah. So this is what we would do, obtain a brief history, physical, um, start him on high flow oxygen, order an ECG, order a chest radiograph, and of course inform your senior. Okay. So I'll just hand it off to Abram again. All right. So yeah, obviously this back and forth is really fun. Hopefully it's fun for you guys as well. <laughs> um, uh, so you, unfortunately for you, he's still in the hospital. Um, but because you're a competent FI1, he's no longer breathless. However, there was a mistake and his chest string was left for an extra day. As a result, he is now getting increasingly agitated and he is threatening to report to deport the ward staff and to build a to build a wall around the hospital. He wants to speak to the consultant, but it is, it is 11 p.m. and it's just your luck. You're the only FY1 on call. The nurse has played you, and they because they are too afraid to approach him. So this is what he looks like now. He's furious, and you have to approach this nice young gentleman. Okay, so these are his vitals. As you can see, they're all within normal range, so nothing too alarming. What would you do in this case? Okay, so just giving you a few options here. Um, I think it's quite clear what the answer is, so we'll just move on to the next slide. Okay, so in this case, what do you think has happened to him? Um, we are going to with the diagnosis of delirium. And one of the reasons why we chose this topic is because it's actually a very common hospital complication and occurs in up to 20%, more than 20% of hospitalizations annually. And if you compare someone who is who has similar medical conditions, um, with and without the delirium, with and without delirium, mortality is actually doubled. So it's quite common and it carries quite a big risk. So I've just put this slide here for if you want to know the full de definition of the definition of delirium. Um, they have to contain these four components, but basically these are the four things which you need to know. Um, highlighted in green is a disturbance in attention and cognition. So one, two. It, it is acute and fluctuates, number three, and is caused by physiological disturbance. And your job as an FY wants to find out what that physiological disturbance is. Okay, so this is actually from Gehi Medics. Um, I'm sure we are all familiar with it, um, with this mnemonic, but just in case, you know, it, it, you get questioned during a ward round, the consultant wants to know what are some of the um, different, uh, diff different causes of delirium. Here you go, it's not always just infection. Okay, and it's a nice little mnemonic for you. Um, just a short slide about the three subtypes of delirium. Um, I've put this here because hypoactive delirium is something that is actually really easily missed because most people just attribute it to being sad or um, tired from a prolonged hospital stay. But 
and that often means that hyperactive delirium gets underdiagnosed. So it's important not to miss this out because once you treat the online course, their delirium will improve. Um, management of these different types of delirium are different as well because, for example, in hyperactive delirium, if you give them a lorazepam, that's just going to knock them out completely. So this is what um, we would do in the case of a delirium. You would take these and you would do these investigations as part of your confusion screen. And just for the sake of exams, I've included um, next to each blood test what exactly you're looking for. So for example, in an FPC you're looking for infection, neuroanalysis, UTI. So it's a standard list of investigations you would order off um, in any case of delirium. So management, like I said, a dozen times, you have to treat the underlying cause until you do the ill. It's unlikely things will improve. Um, just some points on management as well. Um, first thing you want to do when approaching, um, when dealing with patients with delirium is to approach them calmly um, and to try to optimize the environment. So things like temperature, like light and noise, they're all really important. Try to keep them in a well-lit room. You want to have regular introductions of your role and your name so that they have some familiarity and rapport with you. Try to maintain a try to maintain a consistent medical team and nursing team if possible. And small things like having a clock in the room or having pictures, um, photographs of their family members can help as well. Um, if none of that work, you've absolutely exhausted that option. You can try using medication, but you want to avoid it where possible because it's not always. I mean, how would you feel if someone were to jab you with a needle as you were just trying to express your feelings, um, to express your anger? So, if, but if you really have to, you can try haloperidol as first line. Either one of these, either oral IM or IV is fine, but I doubt that if a patient's shouting at you, oral would be possible. I would start that with a low dose of 0 0.5 milligrams. And I know the BNF actually says that it is one milligram, but you would consider that this is a little bit of an off-license use. And a lot of these patients are elderly and you don't want to overload their kidneys and their livers. So start with 0 0.5 milligram. If it doesn't work, then you can just repeat it after 30 minutes. And second line, if haloperidol does not work or if it's contraindicated, you can try lorazepam at a low dose of 0 0.5 as well. And other antipsychotics can also be considered, but I would not do I would not touch them unless it's been recommended by a consultant or by a senior. So this is again the same thing, the plan we would do from step 1 to 11. Um, just note as well, with regards to MMSE, it's quite likely, do not put too much emphasis on the numbers you get from this test because for a lot of patients who present to a hospital, the MMS, MMSE is likely to be quite deranged as well. So you can do it, but don't put too much emphasis on it if you get a low score. Okay, and last point. All right, so is this the end for Mr. Drum? Uh, no, unfortunately not. His ops were not taken for several hours as he was too agitated from his delirium. When they were finally taken, his um, temperature was spiking high at 41.2 degrees. Upon closer inspection, his urine output over the last 24 hours was minimal. Before the blame game begins, we need to do something. So his ops are as below. He is tachycardic, he is tachypneic, hypotensive, he is running a temperature, and his SpO2 is within normal range. All right, let's see. This is what he looks like right now. A bit scary. <laughs> All right, so um, the, the case was trying to lead you on to, uh, to a diagnosis of sepsis, yeah? So um, based on new guidelines, um, sepsis can be defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Now this is, um, we follow the third consensus definition, okay? So the clinical criterion states that we need at least two or more um, points in the SOFA score, um, which will give us a total mortality rate of about 10%. So if we use the mnemonic HAT, hypertension, altered mental status, and tachypnea, two out of three of these things um, is actually sepsis, is the clinical criterion. Okay? So what are the management principles for a patient uh, presenting with sepsis? Firstly, you want to prepare your sepsis 6 protocol. Uh, you want to call your senior and you want to identify the source of infection. In this case, it's probably urosepsis. Now, um, sepsis 6, um, it's really simple. Um, you need to make sure that the patient um, gets three things. No, you give the patient three things and you take from the patient three other things. So you get three out, which are blood cultures, urine output, as well as an ABG. Uh, you want 
look at their lactate levels, and three in fluids, empirical antibiotics, as well as oxygen. So um, if you could quickly outline your plan at this point. So again, diagnosis is sepsis. Okay, you can pause here if you like, but this is ours. So we want to do a continuous vital sign monitoring. We want to give him a, a nasal cannula oxygen of 3 liters per minute. You want to keep the SpO2 between 94 to 98%. Insert two large for IV cannulas, obtain all these blunts, obtain urine for CNS. Um, we want to remove the current catheter and reinsert, uh, not forgetting that he has urosepsis. And you want to start him on empirical antibiotics. So the one that is um, uh, the one that is suitable for um, urinary tract infection in this case would be an IV sulfuroxam, 1.5 grams, three times a day, and aggressive fluid resuscitation as well, and form the senior. Okay. All right, so you might question, how much fluids do we actually give? So in the case of sepsis, you're going to give about 30 ml per kilo bolus of 0.9% normal saline until the blood pressure and tissue perfusion um, levels are acceptable. But then you might question, when would I know to stop fluids? Well, you have to ask yourself three questions. Are there any signs of fluid overload, such as an APO? Have any parameters improved? And have parameters achieved? target response values. So what are the response values? Just put it up here. So you want to achieve a blood pressure, with, uh, a systolic blood pressure more than 90 millimeters mercury. Uh, you want to ensure a normal conscious state of course. Respiratory rate between 20 to 25 beats per minute as well as lactate less than 2 millimoles per liter. Alright, so um, next moving on, um, there's something called septic shock. We no longer use the SIRS severe sepsis, sepsis criteria anymore. So we're sticking to the third consensus definition, yeah? Which states that uh, sepsis, septic shock is a subset of sepsis in which underlying circulatory and cellular metabolic abnormalities are profound enough to substantially increase mortality. So all of these are words, we convert them to a clinical criterion. Um, you actually have sepsis plus persistent hypertension requiring vasopressors, in this case noradrenaline, to maintain a MAP greater than or equal to 65 and a lactate greater than or equal to 2 millimoles per liter. Now you've got all these criteria together, hospital, hospital mortality is in excess of 40%, so it is very important that we pick this up early and we treat, okay? So yeah, um, you've successfully treated your patient. Um, Mr. Trump is discharged and is very traumatized by the multiple harrowing near-death experiences. He wants to live a healthier lifestyle so as never to be placed under your care again. So congratulations. <laughs> okay, you survived F11 now into F12. Yeah. So this we've just included some questions because I always love questions at the end of lectures. So we've included nine questions. Um, you can. I will be uploading these slides to PALS and you can get them from there. So if you want to do these questions, go ahead. Um, the answers will be as you click down in, pre in presentation mode. Um, just to note, just let you guys know as well, these questions were created by us. Um, so if you have any strong objections about any of our answers, please feel free to let us know if you need an explanation for our reasoning as well. Um, just drop us an email, we've included it in the final slide of this lecture. Um, and I guess that's the end of our presentation. Hope yeah. you found it useful and feel free to give us any feedback. All right, all the best for studies.